Kent, and thank you, worship team, for ushering in his presence. If you could stand, we're going to stand for the reading of the word. Matthew 21, chapter 21, verse 42. Just want to say for those of you who sacrificed so much during Messiah, the cast for several months, the, the technical crew, the backstage people, the artists, the construction crew, the ushers, the hostess, the ticket takers, the greeters, the child care workers, the food preparers, and I'm sure I'm missing someone. I probably am, and I'm so sorry if, I, if I'm missing some job. But the massive amount of jobs and people that it took to make it happen. It was a huge team effort. And from the pastoral team and the many lives that were impacted, I just want to say a big thank you. Why don't you give Messiah and everybody involved a hand right now? Such a job well done. Matthew 21, verse 42. So good to be in the house of God with you tonight. I know many of you are tired. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall... It will grind him to powder. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of shall be broken. Shall be broken. Can we pray? Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be in your presence tonight. Thank you for this wonderful group of people, Lord, that came to be in your presence, to to hear your word, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you would speak life, that you would speak something into each and every individual, Lord. Tonight, Lord, let them hear what you want them to hear. And let me speak what you want me to speak, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you were involved in Messiah and you're anything like the very human people in my household, I know that you've sacrificed to a point of exhaustion and you're likely still tired. You were stretched thin. You were broken, so to speak, especially in those last couple of weeks. And and I see the brokenness of, of people all around me. The hospital prayer list, if you were to look at it, it's it's quite full. And the needs that I see around me are just overwhelming sometimes. And And there are some very serious needs, health needs, financial needs. And it feels like many people are just experiencing a great level of brokenness right now that just won't go away. And no one likes to be broken. But here's reality. It's a strong part of life, especially of a Christian life. And I've come today to attempt to give you some hope, but also to give you some practical advice as well in how to embrace this reality of shall be broken, how to embrace your brokenness. Many of you may be familiar with with the story of Simone Biles. She's a gymnast. It was just a few years ago that Simone was on top of the world, and and she had achieved incredible success as a gymnast, winning over 30 Olympic and World Championship medals, which would make her the most decorated gymnast in the history of gymnastics and is considered by many to be the greatest gymnast of all time. And she had become an icon and a household name for extraordinary athleticism and her grace on the mat. But on July 29, 2021, in the Olympic Games in Tokyo, Simone, who seemed to be unshakable and unbeatable, she made the headlines for a different reason. 
Simone withdrew from several key events in the Olympics, saying that the reason was due to her mental health concerns. It was later revealed that she had been struggling with a condition called the twisties. Anybody ever heard of that? It's a phenomenon in gymnastics where an athlete loses their mental awareness, possibly while they're even in the, in the air, and, and, it, and it only lasts for a few seconds, but it's enough to throw the whole routine off, or worse, to injure the athlete. And for Simone, this decision was a, it was a very difficult one. She had dedicated most of her life training for this very moment. And she had high hopes of bringing home several gold medals for the, for the United States and, and would even officially seal the deal that she was the goat of gymnastics. But in the face of adversity, feeling a sense of something not being right, something that felt broken within her, she chose to confront her own brokenness in a way that momentarily it disappointed everyone who was watching around the world. And she chose to prioritize her own well-being over her own perceived and imagined success in that moment. And only time will tell the deci- how the decision will shape the remainder of Simone's life. In an interview with NBC, she spoke openly about her struggles, saying, it's been really stressful, this Olympic Games. It just stinks when you're fighting with your own head, and and I don't trust myself as much anymore, and and I have to focus on my my mental health and not jeopardize my health and well-being. And whether it was right or wrong, I'm not the judge. Honestly, I really don't even have any interest in gymnastics. I don't watch it, and and I definitely don't do it. (laughs) But I have to respect the fact that Simone did what she felt was necessary to address her brokenness. And though there's nothing about Simone's life that leads me to believe that this was a spiritual decision, this decision to embrace that brokenness, to realize that she wasn't as superhuman as everyone thought that she was. This is, this is a very powerful example of what it means to pursue Jesus. Follow me here. Romans 5, verses 3 through 6. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and Patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here's reality for us all. It's not easy for us to embrace our weaknesses and our limitations. It's not easy. And it takes courage to face our struggles with life and to embrace our brokenness and and our limitations. I have limits. But it's when we surrender ourselves to Jesus and we trust in His strength and His guidance That's when we can find the courage. And that's when we can find the resilience to face even the toughest challenges in life. You see, we're taught by human nature to to guard against brokenness in life because no one wants to experience brokenness. From birth, our cries spring forth out of our mouths and we... And we cry out for help to satisfy those deep desires and those wishes and those wants and those needs of ourselves, even at birth. And we're taught from the beginning that we need something greater, something bigger than what's encapsulated in ourselves to survive and overcome this world. And it starts as as a helplessness and a dependency on our parents. But as life life goes, it's, it's natural for us to begin to to feed ourselves on our own, right? 
It's natural for us to begin to dress ourselves on our own and, and to take care of ourselves. And that's, that's a normal maturing process of life. And somewhere along the way, it's almost like most of us begin to mature just a little bit too much. And we begin to take it just a little bit too far. And we sometimes begin to lose sight of our dependence on God. And I start thinking that, that I've got this thing called life. I got it. I can handle this life without anyone's help. And it's within my ability to be successful in life. And, and in this process, we actually begin to lose our way. We think that we're gaining control and we're actually losing control. Tonight, just a, a few days after celebrating the resurrection of Christ, I want to reflect on the importance of embracing our brokenness in the life of a Christian. As we read in Matthew 21, we're reminded of the, of the significance of the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the head of the corner. And the stone is none other, none other than Jesus Christ himself, who, as we saw in our Messiah production, was rejected. He was rejected by the religious authorities of his day, but was ultimately exalted as the, as the cornerstone of our salvation. And in this passage, Jesus warns the Jewish leaders that the kingdom of God will be taken away from them. And it will be given to a nation that will produce fruit for the kingdom of God. And this prophecy came true when the gospel message began to spread throughout the entire world and people of all nations came to know Jesus Christ. And this was an exciting prophecy and it was, an exci it was exciting to, to look out on a vision of what's to come. And it's exciting for even us today. But you have to understand that this passage also has a warning for us today. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 21, 44, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. In other words, those who will willingly submit and humble themselves before Jesus, that person will be broken. But in that brokenness and through that brokenness, they'll find their healing. And they'll find their wholeness. And ultimately, they'll find their way. But on the other hand, those who resist Jesus and who refuse to acknowledge Him as their Lord and Savior is going to face a judgment. And according to Scripture, they'll, they'll be ground to powder. And the truth is, is that, that not one of us in the sanctuary, or those who may be watching online, not one of us desires to be broken. We all want to be in control of our lives, right? And we want to do things our way. But as Christians, we have to realize that brokenness is not only a necessity of our Christian lives, but it's the solution to the overwhelm in our lives. It's a solution to the emptiness in our lives. It's the solution to the despair. It's a solution to the confusion that we have in our lives. And just as Jesus was broken for us, we too must be broken for Him. You see, Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to be broken. And he knows exactly what that pain feels like. And he knows exactly what that rejection feels like. And he's experienced all of those emotions of not feeling like he's enough. But it's in our brokenness that we come to see our need for Jesus. And it's in our brokenness that we learn to rely on him. And we learn to trust in Him. And it's in our 
brokenness that we're transformed at our core and made more like Him. But I want to tell you something tonight. With all of the empathy that I can muster up, brokenness is not easy. And it often comes through horrific trials in our lives and and it comes through hardships and it comes through suffering and it comes through pain. And yet in those moments, we have to remember that God is with us in our brokenness. And He's the one that heals our wounds and who binds up our broken hearts and creates a beautiful, a beautiful end result. You see, the Bible tells us that brokenness is a state of humility and, and repentance. Psalms 51, 17, David writes, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. David was broken after his sin with Bathsheba and, and his murder of Uriah the Hittite. The David, and David suddenly realized the gravity of that sin. And, and he came to God in a brokenness and a repentance. And because of that, because of that, God forgave David and he restored him. But, but David had to be broken first. And likewise, in the New Testament, we see the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The son was living a life of sin and rebellion, but he eventually came to his senses and he returned to his father and and he was desperate. He was humiliated. He was broken financially and emotionally and physically, but, but it was through his brokenness and through his humility that he made it back to the father. And the father welcomed him back with open arms and even threw a feast in his honor. And in both of these stories of brokenness, the the story of David and the story of the prodigal, both of these stories led to restoration and it led to healing. But it was a painful process that required humility and it required repentance and it required surrender. And I, and I, I don't know what you may be facing today. And I know that there's some terrible things that that people are going through right now. It breaks my heart. Right now, I've got a good preacher friend of mine that's that's facing possible cancer of the bladder. I've got a 12-year-old nephew that's facing some, some horrific physical challenges, and he's desperate for a miracle. His name is Aiden. Please pray for him. We just got notified today, as they mentioned in prayer, that Diana Bowen, many of you know her. She's facing some pretty grim heart issues that she found out today. We need to pray for her. She's watching right now. Why don't we we just turn to that camera? Raise your hand and turn to that camera right now. Pray for Diana right now. Lord, if you could put a new heart in her. Heal her heart right now, Lord. Lord, touch Aiden right now. Give them answers, Lord. And I know there's several people close to me that are, that are weighted down with financial struggles. And, and you may not even think that yours is worthy of, uh, of bringing to the table because it may not be a hard issue, but it may be something smaller. But I'm telling you, God feels your pain. And He cares about your pain. And I look out across the congregation of some of you who have lost loved ones in the recent past and and you're now facing a bunch of firsts without those relationships in your life. First Christmases and, and first family gatherings and, 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 and lots of firsts. And it's amazingly tough. 
And the list of broken situations can go on and on and on. I think about many of you who have given of yourselves for months for Messiah to a point where you feel a sense of brokenness within you as you cross the finish line on Sunday. Maybe even a sense of grief this week as you see the the platform being taken down. And as Christians, we must recognize that brokenness is not a one-time event in our lives. But it's a continual process of reminding ourselves that we are not in control. And that we've got to release that sense of control to our Heavenly Father. We are not in control. And when we do that, Jesus will pick up those broken pieces. And He'll begin to create some things in our life that we didn't even know was possible. And it's sort of like the potter and the clay. And and there's a certain amount of brokenness that's necessary in the process of, of creating something that's beautiful and that's functional. And this is because the clay needs to be molded and and it needs to be shaped in order to take on the desired form. And and this requires that the potter begins to manipulate that clay and to shape that clay. And and it's this form of brokenness that's necessary because it allows the potter to take raw and formless clay and turn it into something amazing. And we too have to experience brokenness in order to grow and to develop into the man or the woman that the Lord desires for us to be. And embracing that brokenness is a a necessary part of the process of becoming whole. I'm curious tonight, as I look out across a group of wonderful people. What holds you back from embracing the brokenness in your life? If you're watching online right now, what holds you back from embracing the brokenness in your life and surrendering yourself to Jesus? I want to give you a few possibilities here. First thing that could hold you back is is pride. You may struggle with admitting your weaknesses and and brokenness because you want to maintain a certain image of strength and competence. And you may even see vulnerability as a weakness. And you may feel ashamed or, or embarrassed to admit that you need help. And so pride is one reason. Here's another, fear. Fear. You could be afraid to confront your brokenness because you fear that the pain and the discomfort would be too great to face. And you may also fear the unknown. And you may be uncertain about what lies ahead of you. If you truly surrender your brokenness to Jesus. And so fear can hold us back. And here's another doubt. You may struggle with doubt about whether God is truly good and trustworthy or whether He really cares about you because you've just been through too much. And you may doubt whether surrendering your brokenness to Jesus is really the best option for your life. And so doubt will keep you from embracing your brokenness. Here's another one. Defensiveness. You may have experienced some some horrible hurts and trauma in your past, and it's left you defensive, which makes it very difficult for you to trust others, including God. And that defensiveness may lead you to struggle with feelings of anger or bitterness or unforgiveness which can hold you back in a significant way from surrendering your brokenness to Jesus. That's a tough one. 
And here's the last one, busyness. We live in a very fast-paced and busy culture, and you may simply just not have the time or the space to, to slow down and just reflect and gain meaning from your brokenness. And you may be too caught up in the demands of work and family and hobbies and other obligations to even prioritize your spiritual life. And it's important to recognize that everyone's journey is unique. It's like your fingerprints. Your journey is unique to the person sitting next to you. And different people struggle with different obstacles in embracing their brokenness and surrendering themselves to Jesus. And as a community of apostolic, Holy Ghost-filled believers, it's so vital that we come alongside one another and we support each other and we encourage one another in our faith journeys and we navigate through our brokenness together. Not around it, not over it, not under it, but as we navigate through the pain of our brokenness together. And you see, we've all been broken in some, some way, whether it's through sin or through trauma or, or through life's day-to-day -day challenges. But, but as we submit ourselves to the will of Jesus Christ, there is no doubt in my mind that He will take our brokenness and He'll use it for His glory. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul writes, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's very obvious here that Paul had a thorn in his flesh that he pleaded with God to remove, yet God didn't agree to remove the thorn. God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul understood that his weakness and, and his brokenness allowed God's power to be displayed in his life. And it was through his weakness that God's strength was made perfect. But you may be sitting here tonight wondering, okay, Ryan, you got me. You've pegged me on one of these things that are, that's holding me back from just embracing that brokenness. I haven't carved out enough time for God, or, or I'm facing doubt, or, or I'm facing fear. Okay, Ryan, what do I need to do from here? You're convinced that you need to embrace your brokenness, but what's the practical? What's the practical steps that'll get you there? You know me, I love the practical. Here's the solution. You ready? If you, over, if you want to overcome these obstacles and embrace your brokenness, here's the solution. Turn to Jesus in the middle of your helplessness and rely on His grace and His power, period. Turn to Jesus in the middle of your helplessness and rely on His grace and His power. And I'm not going to leave you hanging from there. I just so happen to have four good practical ways of doing that. The first one is humility. To overcome pride, we need to cultivate a spirit of humility. And this means that we recognize that we're, that we're not self-sufficient and that we do need God's help and we do need the support of others around us. And we need the support of others to live a fulfilling and a fruitful life. And we can also pray for God to give us a humble heart and, and to help us see ourselves and our brokenness as He sees us. And it's not a, it's not a disgrace. God sees it as a strength. Here's the next one, number two, trust. To overcome fear and doubt, we need to 
We need to develop a deeper trust in God. And this means that we have to lean on His promises. We have to believe that He's faithful and that He's trustworthy even in the midst of our pain and struggles. And we do this primarily by by spending time in prayer and by reading the Word of God to, to deepen our understanding of God's amazing character and His unfailing love for us. Another practical help to embrace our brokenness, number three, is healing. Healing to overcome our our past hurts and our wounds. We have to seek healing through prayer, maybe through counseling, through other support systems in in our lives. And, And this may involve working through your grief or working through your forgiveness or processing some crazy emotions within you or or creating healthy boundaries or it could be developing healthy coping mechanisms and and the ability to regulate ourselves better. And here's the deal. We can start by asking God to guide us to the right resources and to the right people to help us with our healing journey. Pray that prayer. Here's the next one, number four, prioritizing. To overcome busyness and distractions and to create the needed margin and good rhythm in life, we need to prioritize our relationship with God and we have to make time for spiritual practices like prayer, Bible study, fellowship with other believers, fellowship with other believers, in the form of small groups, in the form of Sunday school classes, in the form of coming to church on Wednesday night, fellowship with other believers. And yes, that is very, very spiritual. And we can set aside this intentional time every day to spend with God and make it a non-negotiable part of our daily routine. Non-negotiable. And I'll repeat it again. Ultimately, The solution to overcoming these obstacles is to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ and allow Him to work in our hearts and our lives. Even if it's like Paul. Even if it's through, through our brokenness. Because He's the one that can keep us from being ground to powder. He's the one who can transform our brokenness into something that's beautiful. Something that's amazing. He's the one who can give us the strength and the power that we need to live a fruitful and a fulfilling life. So I come to you tonight. And I say, let us embrace our brokenness. Let us see it as an opportunity for God to do a great work in our lives in a very significant way. And let us humble ourselves before Him and acknowledge our need for Him. And let us be willing to submit to His will, even when it means going through the difficult and the painful circumstances. And in our brokenness, Let us turn to Jesus, the cornerstone of our salvation, who was broken for us so that we might be made whole. Let us trust in Him. Let us rely on His grace and mercy to heal our wounds and to restore our wholeness. And Let us remember that brokenness is not the end of of the story, but just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so too will we be raised from these situations into new life. And our brokenness will produce tremendous gain in the kingdom of God as we're transformed and made to be more like Christ. Can we all stand? And I'd love for you to just walk to the front as we as we generally do on a Wednesday night. I've been missing that. If you don't mind, just join me at the front.
We're going to pray. I'm not going to hold you long, just for a few moments. Whether you're online or you're in the, the sanctuary, if you're facing something that's, that's pretty significant right now, it could be a recent occurrence or, or it could have been many years ago, but you're still feeling the effects of that brokenness. First of all, I want to say that my heart goes out to you right now. heart goes out to you. My nephew Aiden is, is facing physical struggles that, that no 12-year-old boy should ever have to face. And no mother or father should ever have to see their son go through something like what he's going through. My heart goes out to Aiden and Courtney and Curtis. And I feel the, the deep pain of that situation, but to them and to, and to all of you, all of you, Diana, who's watching online right now, all of you who are facing these significant things, I want to say it once again. Let us embrace our brokenness and surrender ourselves to Jesus because He's the one. He's the one who can turn our Mourning into dancing. He's the one who can turn our sorrow into joy. And He's the one who can take our brokenness and, and make something beautiful out of it. And I'm going to tell you something tonight that His, His grace is sufficient for you. And I'm not going to hold you long, but I wish... I wish somebody in here tonight would just lift their hands and surrender your brokenness right now to God. And I want you to do that as, a, as an individual thing. I'm going to ask you to pray for someone else in just a moment. But, but I want you to do that as an individual thing. I want you to, I want you to some, however you would like to do it, in your own words, I would like for you to surrender your brokenness right now to Jesus. And he can touch you at home or wherever you may be listening right now. He can touch you right now. And his grace is sufficient for you as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you on Sunday online. But for those of you in the auditorium, lift your hands right now. Why don't you join in with somebody next to you? Pray for someone next to you.